Are you a mother, a father, or you are involved in caring for children? If yes, then listen to Ask the Pediatricians every Thursday by 10 a.m. for insightful discussion on popular child health topics such as dangerous child health practices, immunization, infant feeding, developmental milestones, and so much more. You also get to ask questions on these topics and listen to answers to real-life child health issues by a pediatrician. Ask the Pediatricians Foundation is devoted to health education and information of parents and caregivers of children in the community to support you in raising healthy children. Don't miss Ask the Pediatricians with Dr. Bimi because it's informative, educative and interactive. Ask the Pediatricians Hour. The program for caring parents. Hi everyone and welcome to a fresh episode of Ask the Pediatrician Hour. Uh, my name is Dennis Ravoide and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, those of you who are old uh, listeners and those who are joining us for the very first time today, you are welcome to this fresh episode of Ask the Pediatrician as a program devoted to us uh discussing topics that have to do with the health of our children and it is brought to you by Ask the Pediatrician Foundation. Uh, it's an organization that is committed to making sure that no child dies from preventable causes of death in children. And so whether you're watching me live on Ask the Pediatrician Foundation Facebook page or Fresh Way Street Radio Facebook page, or our YouTube channel, uh, you are warmly welcome. Or you are listening to me uh, live and direct on Fresh Waves Radio or my podcast, Ask Dr. Bemi ATP Podcast. I also want to welcome you. And for those of you who are actually watching again after the live event, I also want to welcome you all. Uh, whatever time of the day you're watching this program, you are warmly welcome. And we're going to be discussing another very important topic today about the health of our children. I just want to remind you that you can watch past episodes of this program on all the platforms that you are watching on right now. And you can also ask your questions by emailing me, Dr. Bemi Salah at AskThePediatricians.com. And of course, you can always head over to our Ask the Pediatricians Facebook page. So ask your questions from Mondays to Saturdays. And of course, I'm also live most Mondays on our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram channel. So answer your questions live and direct. So you're welcome, welcome, welcome. And today I'm going to be talking about something that is also very important. We're going to be talking about conversions. Okay, conversion is one of those things that can be very scary for parents when it happens. And it's something that can actually happen in children and it has to be managed appropriately. Uh, there are many other words we use for things like conversion. Sometimes we like to call it seizures uh, because um, that is a more encompassing word, but parents are more familiar with the word conversion. So let's start with what is conversion. Uh, conversion is like an involuntary movement of both hands and sometimes the legs of a child, you know, and it, and it is due to uh, like an abnormal discharge in the brain. So you see a child starts, you know, either they go very safe and then they begin to shake or jerk their hands and their legs. And it's like they are not conscious of what is happening as at the time they are doing it. So it's can be very, very scary for parents. And you tend to see the picture of everybody, you know, panicking and running health to skelter. And some people are bringing water, pouring it on the child. Some people are bringing salt. Some people are putting the hands in the fire or in the legs in the fire and all that. So I'm sure many of you parents, as I'm talking about it, either you've seen it before or you've heard about it, it's something that we, we sometimes see in children. But there are other form of what we call seizures. You know, conversion is actually one of the form of seizures. But there are other involuntary movements that children can also have that may not be as that dramatic, but they are also 
are known as seizures and whether the, the traumatic conversion type that involves all those checking or safety or the child even falling and um, passing out or the non-dramatic one, they all have to do with brain. They all have to do with the brain of the child. And what is happening in a child who is conversing is that there's an abnormal discharge of messages being sent from the brain and to the hands and to the rest of the body and that the child has no control over at that time. Usually they will last for either a few seconds, sometimes they can last for a, a minute, sometimes they seem to last longer than that. And that is even when they become more scary. Usually once they start lasting more than five minutes, uh, we start talking about what we call uh, status or something. Sometimes they can last up to 30 minutes and sometimes the children did not really wake up and they do it and then they didn't wake up, then they continue, they rest a bit and they continue again. That is now becoming prolonged. And like I said, it is something that is so scary to parents. And the question is now, what do we do when children are conversing? How do we manage it? What is even causing this conversion? And how do we manage a child who is conversing? And so today I'm actually going to be laying emphasis on what we should not do and then also what we should do because I find that sometimes parents uh, in the panic of the episode, we tend to do a lot of things that actually are not right and sometimes make things worse afterwards. In other words, even when the child has the conversion is now over, then the pediatricians, we have to start dealing with uh, what has been caused by parents in the process of trying to address the conversion itself. And sometimes it's even worse than the conversion itself. So it's so important for us to know what to do and what not to do when a child is having conversion. So for the purpose of today's discussion, I'm going to limit myself to just conversion. I think another time I'm going to come back and talk about epilepsy and then talk about other kind of uh, seizures on that, that particular topic. But today let's just restrict ourselves to the conversion, which is what we mean by that stiffening and checking of the uh, hands and the legs in a child and due to that abnormal discharge in the brain. Now, before we go too far, I need to differentiate there are two kinds of conversion that can happen. And it is so important for us as parents to note this. So it's either a conversion happens with fever or without fever. It is very, very important that you note that because the way we address the two of them are quite different, okay? So if a child has conversion with fever or a child has conversion with fever, so the conversion that occurs with fever, actually in children between the ages of six months to six years, we call it febrile conversion. So it's just a big struggle to say, this is a conversion that is due to high fever. So this is one of the reasons why we talk about fevers that we don't want fever going so high. That is why we talk about how we manage fevers and all that. Which I'm still going to recap again today because one thing with fever conversion is that it is due to fever, especially when the fever is high, and it also tends to occur in some families. So whenever the children have high fever, then the next thing is start to converse. So that is one category of conversion. We also have the category of conversion that when the child is conversing before and during the episode of conversion, there is no fever. Okay, it's also important to know that because the causes of conversion without fever is different from the causes of conversion with fever. And that will determine how we address the two of them. So it's so important for you to know. And sometimes parents are not always sure whether or, or it was a child having fever before or not. So, but it's something you should take note of and going forward that if the child is conversing, you want to quickly check the child was having the child having fever before or not. Sometimes some children already ask they are sick, they've been having fever before the conversion. So it's easier for parents to remember. But for children who are otherwise well and nothing was happening, we should always check if the child having fever or not before they have conversion. Because that actually separates conversions into those two categories. The conversion that occur as a result of high fever and the conversion that occur as a result of or with no fever. Let's put it that way. So those are what we call febrile conversions or 
fibrous skin though, and we also want to call a fibral. That is a without with fibra means a fibra. That means without uh, fever conversion. So a fibrous seizures. So those are the two big categories that we for for have to differentiate so for children with the fibra conversion it is so easy anything that will make a child to have high fever can lead to them having conversion especially in that age group of six months to six years some people will say we should make it as early as three months and some people say we should make it maybe by five years so usually before the at the age of three months any child has fever um and they converse, we think of other things. But if, but usually between the age of three months or six months to six years, they, when children have fever and they have combustion, we are not so worried because we know it is the eye fever causing the combustion. But what we need to know is what is causing the fever and we need to deal with the fever. So it could be malaria, it could be pneumonia, it could be any infection per se, whether it's infection due to viruses or infection due to bacteria, or yeah, it could be infection in any part of the body. It could be in the chest, pneumonia. It could be in the tummy, gastroenteritis. It could be in the ears, ear yeah, infection, otitis media. It could be in the throats, you know, pharyngitis and all those kind of sore throats. Anything that makes a child to be very hot, and then they have. Um, a fever, uh, I mean, especially when it's very high, then those children can convulse. Now, some children tend to do it easily, like even when the fever is not so high, you are still talking about 38 or 39 and they're already convulsing. So we notice that it also runs in certain family. So certain family, uh, people, uh, children in that family tends to have conversion anytime they have fever. Now, why is this so important is that for those kind of families and for those kind of children, whenever they have fever, we are more aggressive with the fever. So we don't want the fever going high at all. We are quickly aggressive with bringing down the fever and we're aggressive with reducing the underlying cause of that fever because that is all we need to do. So if it is malaria, we treat the malaria. If it is, this is not the kind of cases where you are waiting around to see whether, and let me just watch, no. You, the fever is there, you bring it down quickly, you treat the fever, underlying cause of the fever, and hopefully we should be able to avert that conversion. Now, even in that category of fibroid conversion, there are two categories again. <laughs> we have what we call the simple one and the complex one. Okay, so the simple fibroid conversion, the child has high fever, they will convert just once, just once within 24 hour period, and then they are fine afterwards. So, that is, and usually that conversion itself will not last long. It will last less than 15 minutes. It's usually very short. And usually the fever, um, the conversion is just one episode in a, in a day. So that is what we call the simple fibrile conversion. But we also have some children what we call the complex fibrile conversion. So for the complex fibrile conversion, they tend to have it more frequently in that same day. They can have it maybe two, three times in one day in 24 hour period. And then they can have a longer conversion type. So we call them complex fibrile conversions. So those are the, the fibrile conversions. But what we feel like the good news about fibroid conversion is that they tend to stop. Okay, so when the children are about six years, they stop having it. Okay, so we don't need to put children who have fibroid conversions, we don't need to put them on drugs for seizures. Okay, so unlike children who have seizures or conversions without fever, because those are the ones that we classify as having seizure disorder or epilepsy. And those are the category that we have to put them on medications to prevent the conversion long time. So, but for children who are having conversion with fever up to the age of six years, we don't put them on any drugs every day that they have to take to prevent conversion. So, what we normally do is that for each episode of the fever, we are more aggressive. Okay, we want to bring down the fever. So that they don't even converse before. And some children, if they've had it like two, three times, you know, like it's so often and frequent, sometimes we also give the parents drugs 
like diastatum or what is it called zoonium, we give it to them so that whatever the test have in season, we also give them that zoonium. Uh, we surely we give it to the bone or to the mouth so that they, they, we, we kind of reduce the chances of convulsing. Okay, I'll tell you why it's so important that we don't want children convulsing and why we don't want children convulsing for so long. Okay, I will explain that later. But I just want you to give one of the differences between fibrile convulsion and the afibrile convulsion. That children with fibrile convulsions, we just focus on the fever, treating the fever, reducing the fever, and treating the underlying cause of fever. But we don't put the children on drugs they have to take every day. Whereas children who have convulsions, we need health fever. We classify them as infibrous seizures, and if they are having it several times, we have to put them on medications for conversion that they have to take every day for a long time, usually sometimes two years and beyond, so that the seizures can be controlled. So that is it's also important for parents to this because sometimes I say people whose children just have fibrous conversion and somebody has gone to put them on medication for conversion like phenobab or other drugs for conversion that they have to be taken every day, which is wrong. We don't do that. I think a mom was here asking me very recently on our Facebook group, her child had fib all look like fibrile conversion. And then they've gone to put the child on epilim, which is a drug for uh, children that have conversion without fever and an epileptic drug. And her mom was really worried. So that is what's wrong. And I was trying to tell her, you have to go back to the doctor and let them understand what will happen. Because once we start those kind of drugs, we start it and we're using it for long. So they are not less than two years kind of start. So it's not a drug you put a child on and stop anyhow. We have to use it for long. So you don't put it when it is not necessary. So that is the conversion. So those have the same fibrile conversion. What about children who have conversion without fever? Now, when children have conversion without fever, we have to look into the brain. Is there something going on in the brain? So the commonest reason why children have conversions without fever is what we call epilepsy. And to be honest, we don't know the cause most of the time. We think there's some genetic reasons. So that's why it runs in some family. We see that everybody in that family depends on epilepsy. That is why people say family is here. And even some of our cultures, even when they don't know medicine, they know that. We always ask about whether in that family depends on the blessing, but they know there's some of those things that connected that is passed from one generation to the other. So it is nowadays that we are now doing a lot more research in genes and we're doing more, we're able to look more into things like the genes and all that. We are beginning to find out that some of those epilepsies that we said that have no cause or we don't know the cause are actually due to genetic problems. So uh, so those are the kind of uh, epilepsy due to genetic problem. Sometimes it really persists like a tumor in the brain, like a child, something is growing in the brain of that child. It could be a tumor, it could be a cancer, and all that. That can also make the child to have conversions, okay? And sometimes some children can have um, um, other infections too. But usually, like, like meningitis, uh, and if uh, all those ones, they also can cause conversion. But they tend to also have fever with it as well. And sometimes if that, uh, after the episode has been treated, one of the complications of meningitis or encephalitis is that that child may have some injury in the brain that will not make the child to start having seizures later on, okay? Sometimes it could be this, the electrolytes. You know, what we call there are some things in our bloods that control things, and uh, if they are too low or too high, like sodium and all those things, they can also make it try to have seizures. All right, so those are other things that we cause seizures. Sometimes we have some other diseases, we call them metabolic disorders, and all that, they can also make it try to have seizures. But the majority of the time, we don't really know why those children are having the seizures. Uh, we know some children have some abnormal formation of the brain too. You know, either the 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 the, 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 the brain during the time the brain was being formed was not formed properly. That can also cause seizures. If a child has needed to have surgery from the brain, or children will have hydrocephalus and there's too much water in the brain, all those kinds of anything going wrong with the brain, any injury at all in the brain, 
Our children, we didn't cry at birth, you know, and because of that, they suffer injury in their brain. Or children who, who had uh, bleeding in their brain, especially our premature babies, and, you know, that has caused some also injury in the brain. Whatever the injury is, so it can lead to a child. That part of that brain that is injured is now what we call a focus that can discharge abnormally at times. And when it discharges, it makes the child to have convulsions or epilepsy, but usually without fever. So those are the main causes of uh, conversions. So I've talked about co conversions due to fever and conversions without fever. And I've talked about the causes of conversion with fever is the fever itself, especially when it is very high. And then usually some family is free, like in this family, when they tend to have fever, they tend to have conversion. But anything that will make the child to have fever can cause conversion in those children who already have that genetic tendency to have fibroid conversions. And then I'll talk about the other category of children who have conversions without fever. Any injury whatsoever in the brain can lead to them having conversions, whether the brain is properly formed or there's an abnormal tumor in the, or something growing abnormally in the brain. Or sometimes some genetic problems, epilepsy kind of syndromes, they can make the child to have seizures or the child who already has any brain injury, maybe during birth, during delivery, uh, previous infections in the brain like meningitis, uh, encephalitis, and all that. So those are the other causes of um, conversion, conversion without fever. Now, how do you know when a child is having conversion? Like I said, most times the children themselves are not aware, but sometimes, sometimes you don't just have this feeling, we call it aura, we feel that something is about to happen. So there are different kinds of conversions. We have what we call the simple, we have what we call complex partial. I don't want to call you with all those medical jargons, but basically sometimes children have where something is about to happen. So they, they might have feel like the um, visual taste or some pain, tingling and all that. Then the next thing, the sense of convulsion, and stress and all that. But sometimes children don't know it's about to happen. They could be sleeping and it could happen in their sleep. They could be awake, they may just drop. But one of the things that you start seeing them, you know, going stiff, and then you see them checking, you know, it could be one side, it could be both hands, it could be both legs, it could be only one side, and you check and all that. But so usually that is what we experience. And then you start calling the child. Most of the time they don't respond to you calling them. And sometimes some of them will drink out foam or saliva. And a lot of people have a lot of meat. They believe that that form was something. If you touch this, another person, the person is going to start having conversion. So that is not true. That conversion is not infectious. Okay, it is not like COVID nineteen. It is not like uh, Ebola or any of those diseases. So, in other words, if you come, if you have somebody who is having seizures or conversion, you are not going to catch it from them. Whether you touch their saliva or urine or whatever, you're not going to catch it. Take that from me, all right? So you don't need to be scared of helping people who are conversing. So please, this is not infectious. So some children will do it. And like I said, it can last for one second, two seconds, few seconds to one minute, five minutes. And some people have what we call the prolonged one. We call it status. We call it status, epilepticals, where they actually have it longer than five minutes. It can be up, up to 30 minutes. And they don't even wake up in between those episodes. We usually worry about those ones. Okay, That's the one that scared us the most. But most other people just have the conversion and then they wake up or they sleep, you know, they sleep off afterwards so they can decide to, they, some people will pass urine, some children will pass feces, some children will bring out the saliva, which is the typical thing people always put in Nollywood movies, like they're always bringing out foam, but it's not always true. Most children don't actually bring out any foam, but they can sleep off or they can pass urine. Or sometimes they will be as if they are not themselves for a few minutes before they will recover themselves. So that is what you see in conversion. But most of the time, conversions stop on their own, and that's it. So usually we, so what we normally say is that if somebody is having conversion, there is no first aid at home to do. That is the most important message I think I want parents to know. 
there's no first aid for conversion at all. The drugs that stop conversion are only given in the hospitals or we have given to you as parents. So in some developed countries, we have some of those drugs because when somebody is conversing, that's not the time to put sleep, forcing them to drink anything. They can't, you, and you're going to cause them to aspirate or choke on it. So usually the drugs that we can give at that time, is either the drugs that once you just put it on their tongue, it gets absorbed. It is not like they are drinking. It is what we call um, buka drugs. So now we just put it on the cheek and it gets absorbed and it works. Or we put it in their anus. So for children that are like that, that tend to have conversions all the time, what we normally do as doctors that we would have given parents those drugs to give buka something they can put in the, in the mouth. The child doesn't have to swallow it. Just being near their cheek alone, it did work. So we have a called buka medaxolam. It is not available in some countries like Nigeria, but it's available in places like UK. And so most children who have conversions, they have their own drugs at home that they can use. Um, sometimes we have what we call the rectal diazepam for children that tend to have seizures a lot. Some parents can have rectal diazepam because it doesn't go through the home. And if it's touching just otherwise, if you don't have those two medications that have been given to you by your pediatricians and you've been told how to use it, there is nothing you can give to stop conversion at home. So there is no first step. So most of what we do, or most of what people used to do, let me not say we, and trying to stop conversion at home, they don't stop the conversion. They are very dangerous. I'm going to make give you a little list after, and they actually work safely for the child. So what you do in that situation, if that is conversing at home, what you need to do is to make sure the child does not injure themselves. That's what you need to do. Keep them safe so that they don't get injured. And then when the conversion stops, you go to the hospital. Usually we say time the conversion so that you can tell the doctor how long it last for. But once it's lasting more than five minutes, you are calling the ambulance. If it's that time minutes, in Italy, we expect most promotion will stop within 30 seconds to 90 seconds. In other words, within the half a sec, half a minute to a minute, most conversion will stop. Majority of them stop. So in other words, you don't need to do anything because it's going to stop by itself anyway. And then you have now take the child to hospital to know. But in that process, the most important thing is that the child does not hurt themselves that is the most important thing we want you to do for us so if there's any tight clothing around their neck you remove it okay you put you rem you know children sometimes when they're conversing they are not aware of it so they can drop so if they're in a place where the floor is hard and all that you need to kind of shield them so that they don't eat their head because they can't it's the head now and start having head injury, bleed in the brain, and that's the problem we'll be dealing with after the conversion has gone. So we don't want them to eat their head on the floor. We don't want any tight clothing around their neck, like chains or things that can choke them. You need to remove those things and then just let them lie down on the side so, so that if they drew saliva or anything, it will come out and it doesn't choke them. The tongue doesn't fall back and choke them and all that. You know, because sometimes some people for me, some people make a lot of saliva and those are things that can choke them. So you turn them, what we call recovery position. It just means on, on the side and the face towards the side. If you look at, if you check online for recovery position, you will see that posture. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture to show us right now. But it just means they turn them like down the side, but their head turns to one side. That's all. And just make sure, just leave them. That's it. Just leave them. Let them stop the conversions. So that is all you need to do. It is as simple as that. And when the conversion has stopped, usually, like I said, in 30 seconds to 60 seconds, 90 seconds, max five minutes, you take them to the hospital. If the conversion is not stopping in five minutes, please call the ambulance service, okay? If you know, most of us have the emergency number in whichever country we live. I know for those of you in Lagos, it's 126767. I know some people live, listening to me, maybe in the UK, um, I think, uh, the, um, sorry, some people is 911, I think in the US, and you have 111 for the UK services and all that. So you have all your ambulance numbers, you have your emergency numbers, please call them. And of course, if you don't have ambulance emergency, just get your own car and take the child to the closest hospital to you. 
you don't have to go to the father's hospital because all most hospitals will know what to do if the mother is convulsing. You have what we call drug to stop convulsion, or whatever time and infection. But most of them are infections, so we have to give it as infection. So just take the time to the patient of specifically inside in the type of conversion is not stopping in five minutes. And if you are living in a country or places where you have ambulance services to call, then just call the ambulance service. That's what you need to do. Now, many things people do, especially in Africa, that's that dangerous and wrong. Please let's stop this, okay? Pouring water on people who is conversing is wrong. And it's not even if you have people conversing. Whenever people faint or collapse or have a conversion, I don't know where that practice <laughs> sprang up from. I don't know where, but people just start getting pure water and cold water and pouring it on them. No, you're only drenching them. You are not resuscitating them. You are not doing anything. You are doing absolutely nothing and you're making things worse for somebody. So if somebody is collapsing around you, Please don't pour water on them. Don't gather around them, which is what people do. You gather around them, film me. Some people will bring out their smartphones and start taking videos and taking pictures. And some people start pouring water. Dangerous practices. Like you say, if you like, we have a, a saying in Mex in that if you cannot help, don't harm. Okay. If you cannot do anything that will be helpful, then don't cause any harm, okay? That's the first one. It's one of our ethical principles in makes In other words, if I cannot help you, I should not hurt your problem, okay? So when you see people conversing or falling or fainting, please don't pour water on them and please don't, don't crowd them. They need oxygen. And when you people crowd around them, you are sucking all the oxygen from them and they're making things worse for them. So please stay away. Put them on their side. Just make sure they don't hurt them. So make sure they don't hit their head on the hard surfaces or things like that. Remove tight clothes and all that. And just let them be. And call for help. Call the ambulance. Call the health professionals who knows uh, who should know what to do. But please, let's stop pouring water on people when they are conversing or when they are fainting and all that. So I'm going to go back to my conversion. No pouring of water. That's number one. No pouring of spirits or anointing oil, okay? People will go and pour spirits on people and pour anointing. So every, some people, now in Nigeria, everybody has anointing oil in their house. It's good, but please don't pour it on somebody who is convulsing. I guess, please don't pour any oil on them. Just let them be. Don't put salt in their eyes, in their nose, in their mouth, in their ears. Don't put salt. Don't cut onions, Okay. Don't cut onions and put it on their faces and all that. Please don't. Uh, what's the other one? Palm oil. Don't put it on them. Don't rub it. Don't put palm oil. Don't do anything. Okay? What else do people do? Um, don't put spoon in the mouth. Yes. I people. I don't know where that also originated from. People believe that when somebody is conversing, they must not clench their teeth. So if they clench the teeth, that means they are going to die. It's a lie. It is not true. It is a myth. Nothing is going to happen to them, whether they clench their teeth and all that. So please don't put any spoon. Most of most people in the process of doing that, you actually destroy the teeth. So you see people putting on more you No, know, that is like a spatula, something for ponies, uh, make sense in the kitchen. They put it in their mouth, they put food in their mouth. Don't, don't, just leave it, leave it alone, all right? Another thing people do, which is one of the things I've experienced with one of my patients, is putting the hands and the legs of the child on the fire. Oh, don't. So this child, I could still remember, I will never forget that story as long as I live. That child was inside out, the fibroid conversion from malaria. But of course, our resuscitation, resuscitation team of families, we want to put the child's hand and legs in the fire in the process of resuscitation. Now, the child came to us in Lowe's. I can still just picture that child lying on the bed. Within one or two days, we've already sorted out the fever, convulsion, and the malaria that is causing the convulsion in the first place. But do you know we dealt with months, months we are dealing with that with that uh, bones that that child had. It is what we call iatrogenic. People caused that problem for that child. The mother spent so much money 
on because if the wounds got infected on infection, we have to call the bones and plastic surgeon because hands and legs um, uh, bones, they are not like the bones you have on your trunk or your back because your hands are functional areas. In other words, when there's, when there's bones involved in the hands, they cause contracture. It means the child will not be able to use that hand. So they have to operate that hand to make sure the child can move it and use it. That costs that child more hundreds of thousands of nairas and stays in the hospital and looking for money and pain and, oh, Lord. Now, each time we see the child, like, this is something this child does not need to have had in the first place. All this happened because of overseas people who don't know what they should do. All they need to do is to have left the child alone and bring the child to us. But now we were dealing with that. I'm not even sure whether that child recovered. Sometimes we lose some of those children from the bones, the bones wound, the bones infection. That is caused by people doing the wrong thing. So please don't. I remember some people put hot iron, press it on the child. Come on, please don't do that. All right, don't do anything. Like I remember my principal. Remember the ethical principle message: If you cannot do any good, don't do any harm. If you can't do anything good, don't do any harm. So in other words, if you cannot help the child's conversion to stop, don't cause other problems. Don't cause bonds. Don't put things that will make things worse for the child. So like I said, the most important thing to do in a child with having conversion is just, just make sure that they're in a place where they cannot hurt themselves. They cannot eat their head on the floor or anything like that. And then when conversion stops, take them to the hospital. There is no first aid for conversion at home. That is it. There are some things that there's nothing you can do at home. People always ask me, Dr. Baby, what is the home remedy? There is no home remedy for conversion. A child has conversion, that child has to go to the hospital. No home remedy. That is the truth. No home remedy. A child is conversing, wait for the conversion to stop, take the child to the hospital. Conversion does not stop in five minutes, call the ambulance service. That child has to go straight into the emergency room. There is no home remedy. There is no wonder drug. And that is why for some of our parents that their children tend to have lots of this conversion, those are the ones that we give the drugs that they can use safely at home. So we give them drugs like uh, bucamidaxolam, something they can put just in the mouth or in the cheek, and that's it. Or we give them rectal diazepam for those also they use it. And that's those are the only other thing. Otherwise, the child has to be to the hospital for treatment by the doctors. And it's an emergency. A child with convulsing is an emergency. That child must go to the hospital, even if the conversion stops, which is another thing parents do. Child has conversion, the conversion stops. Oh, thank God, praise God, all is well. Uh -uh, all is not yet well, Lou. You have to take that child to the hospital. We need to document that conversion. We need to know why the child has conversion. We need to advise you what to do next time. Some children, we need to do blood tests. We need to do EEG if it has been happening several times. We need to do many things. We need to ask the question whether it's fever, without fever, all those kind of things. So we need to do the necessary thing. So a child has conversion. Don't have Zoom. The fact the conversion has stopped and the child is looking okay. That is it. No, you need to still seek appropriate intervention. All right. So I hope you remember that. So the most important thing to know is what to do and what not to do. I'm going to recap it because if that's the only message I pressed across today, I think that's the most important thing for you to know. So the first thing is keep the child safe, remove child clothing, make sure they are in a place where they cannot help themselves, put them in recovery position, wait for the conversion to stop, and take them to the hospital. If the conversion doesn't stop in five minutes, please take them, I um, mean, call the ambulance and get them to the hospital as fast as possible. Now, let's talk about how do we manage conversion. So, that's just very straightforward. So, we have drugs that can stop conversion. So, if when you bring the child to us in the hospital, the child is still conversion. We have drugs we can give. We have infection. We focus this to stop conversion. So we have our diazepam, we have our taragai, we have all these kind of conversion drugs. We we'll give it conversion. It's only doctors that can do that in the hospitals. And uh, when the conversion stops, we need to know why is this child having conversion. So we ask all those questions. So we ask 
still uh, with fourth resource, I say the child, of course, the child, will, if the child is not conscious, we make sure that their hair is not blocked. We make sure that they are breathing well. If they need oxygen, we make sure we put it there. We do all our resuscitation efforts, stabilize the child, and then we ask you all those questions. Is it with fever, without fever? How old is this child? You know, help us to know, okay, it's fibroid conversion. It's not a fibroid conversion, okay? So, fibroid conversion, why is that having fever? We need to do full block count, we need to do malaria tests, we need to do uh, culture from the throats or from the ears, and blood culture, what is causing this, this problem? And then we treat the underlying cause of that fever, and hopefully the child gets better, and hopefully people that resuscitated the child have not caused other problems for us that we have to deal with, and then the child can go home. If the fibroid conversion happens again, then we will give you something to use for that, like prevention of fibroid conversion. Although no, sometimes, no matter what we do, sometimes we always have that fibroid conversion, but we can do some other, some of us give you the other pump to use once they start having fibroid for the fibroid conversion, we have to give them the other pump for a stomach, you are very aggressive, bring them to the hospital. They are not the kind of children you'll be looking at and waiting and say, let me just go. No, you have come to the hospital quickly so that we deal with it. So that is for fever conversion. For children with child uh, fever and they're having conversions and it's happening more than two times without fever, then we need to look for the cause. So we do things like EEG. EEG is like the electric, uh, it's like looking at the electricity circulating in the brain, uh, just like the ECG, you know, the way we do ECG for the heart, we do EEG uh, for the brain, and we look at whether, where is the abnormal discharge coming from? Sometimes for some children, depending on what we see on physical examination, we may want to do a scan. For example, if we suspect that this child may have a tumor or something growing in the brain, there's one of my patients, that's how I discovered, you know, the child was having seizures, that was all the mother came to us with, and I was like, wow, let's just do a brain scan. And lo and behold, this child actually has a brain tumor. Yeah, that was what's causing the conversion. So it's not all the conversion we just give drugs and send you away. We need to know why it's so important. And that's how we discovered this girl has brain tumor. And luckily, we're able to cut it early. She went to India. She had a surgery, and she's doing well. So sometimes we we have to do some of those. Sometimes we ask some of those parents, oh, it's so expensive. But sometimes you never know what we're going to find. Sometimes we do the blood test. We do all the usual things we do. And then we try and treat the underlying cause if we find any. But sometimes we don't find any cause. Uh, like, like I said, the, like most of the epilepsy, you do your brain scan, it's going to be fine. You do all the blood tests, they're going to be fine. Your EEG may even be normal, but that does not rule out seizures. Seizure is clinical because at the time we are doing the EEG, the child may not be having seizures, so the EEG may be normal. So a normal EEG does not rule out epilepsy, does not rule out seizures. It just tell us, okay, as at the time we did our EEG, nothing was found, but we rely on the what the child is actually doing more. And there are different kinds of EEGs. Sometimes we do it without them, you know, we make sure the child did not sleep before we did the EEG. Sometimes we do it during sleep. We do, sometimes we do what we call video telemetry. We, we are feeding the child and doing the EEG at the same time and seeing whether we can match the conversion with the brain activity so there are many things we do but that's the job of your pediatrician especially the pediatric neurologist and then we we'll, we we'll deal with that so some children that keep on having the seizures without fever it's important that they're on medication so you need to give them the medication regularly and i'm going to sound a note of warning here as i'm beginning to round up now some also you put your child on drugs for conversion Usually we don't put it for those who don't, who just only have fever. For those who have fever and conversion, like I told you, it's only when they're having fever that we, we handle those things, but they don't need to be on drugs every day. But for children without fever, who has had conversion without fever at least two times or more, we usually will put them on what we call anti-epileptic drugs anti-epileptic drugs. Those are drugs to stop them from having conversions. Now, I forgot to mention, I was going to tell you, why do we think we don't want conversions to last so long? Because when a child is conversing, it is the brain. The brain is overworking. The brain is discharging, is making a lot of... And during that period, 
oxygen supply to the brain is reduced, okay? So if a child continues to have convulsion for so long, then it's going to cause a damage to the brain. And sometimes a child who is having convulsion is having convulsion because they already have a damage or an injury in the brain. So if the convulsion now goes for so long again, the convulsion can reduce oxygen and everything supplied to the brain. And the brain is one of those very sensitive organs in the body. It, it, it could be fatal. Some children could actually die from that. So we don't want the child to pass out. You know, we don't want children to die from the prolonged epilepsy and usually, I mean, sorry, prolonged seizure. And even the prolonged seizure can cause more brain damage. And more brain damage means the child will keep on having more seizures. The recovery will be less. The child may lose their skills. So that's why some parents will tell you, oh, my child has conversion. My child was walking before, was talking before, had a long conversion, and now the child can no longer walk. The child can no longer talk. The child has lost so many skills. It's because sometimes that long conversion has caused more damage in the brain, and the child has now lost their skills. So that is why we don't want conversion going on for too long. Five minutes, we want to stop. And sometimes some children's conversion are so bad, we're giving them drug one, it's not working, we're giving them drug two, it's not working, we're taking them to ICU. They are going into the ICU, we just have to get that conversion and that conversion. Sometimes you just have to paralyze the child, put them, you know, and, you know, stop that conversion. So that is the job of the anesthetist and the specialist, they know what to go. But our role is to make sure that the conversion does not go on for too long. Your role as parents is to make sure you bring the child to us. Once it's going on for too long, once it's five minutes, you are in the hospital. You're in the hospital. So that is an important thing for us to remember. So if a child is having seizures without fever several times, we put them on medication. Now, this medication are not for malaria, paracetamol kind of medication. Number one, they must only be prescribed by a pediatrician, a specialist. Number two, when we say take them eight o'clock, we meant eight o'clock. Don't say, oh, I forgot, I'll take them at 10 o'clock. The child can have seizures before 10 o'clock. So if it's eight o'clock in the morning, most of them are usually 12 hours apart. Some of them, eight hours apart, but majority, we try to make it right in that appearance. So we want you to give them at times that is easy. So most of the time it's 12 hours. So eight o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock at night. It's not like I forgot, I'll just take it anytime in the morning, anytime in the night. No. They are very strict. 12 hours apart is 12 hours apart. Eight hours apart is eight hours apart. They are not medication you forget to take. You must take them every day, okay? Because each time you forget to take the medication, the child can have more conversion, what we call rebound seizures. And when they have more conversion, sometimes for us to get them back to no conversion is a tug of war. Seriously speaking, because I see a lot of parents ask us questions about seizures. I see parents tell me, oh, I just stopped the medication because the child is no longer having seizures. Please never do that. That is the most dangerous thing you can ever do to a child. So even us as pediatricians, when your child, we when we put your child on those medications, we usually have this conversation with you. But I notice that some of you don't have that conversation. Maybe I don't know what no excuse for that, but I don't know why. But maybe you are not listening for some time parents or something. <laughs> There are so many things going through our brain, so no blame. So it's important for you to have this conversation with the doctor. Number one, the medication, the dose. Number two, the timing, you must always get it right. They don't just finish. Those medications don't finish, and then you say, oh, I forgot to buy it, I'll buy it. No, no. Before they finish, you've got some more, okay? You should never stop those medications on your own. Never. It's not a medication, oh, my child is not have a conversion again, then I'm going to say, no, you don't do it like that. We must always take the medication. Like I said, most of the time when we give push on those medications, we are telling you you are going to be on it for like two years straight. Your child is not having commotion. It doesn't matter. Your child is going to take the medication. He's going to take the medication every day for like those two years. After two years of no conversion, there was no less chance whether we can stop this medication. And even when we want to do that process, we do what we call a daily half of the medication. In other words, we reduce the medication a little at a time. We don't just say, okay, you've taken epilim for two years, just stop by. No, you don't. Those medications take time to build up in your blood. They also have to take time to gradually go out of the system. If you suddenly stop them, you, you can get into trouble. Your child can start having more conversions. We are back to square one. 
So even when the pediatricians want to stop it, we stop it gradually. For example, we can do it over like three months. And sometimes I try to do mine over six months because I really, really want to go as so I start reducing them, maybe 50 milligram takeoff, you know, reduce, and then until we finally get it to stop. And we hope that we can get them to stop without the child having conversion again. Because once the child having conversion again, all those two years are gone. We're starting all over again. So it's so important for parents to understand this. So it's a medication you take regularly. And when you are on those medications, you must be seeing your pediatrician or the pediatrologist or whichever specialist put the child on that medication. It's not a medication you take and you wave goodbye. So I've, I've done an outreach clinic before and I saw a family and this child is still medication they prescribe for like five, six years, never reduce, changed doses, never reviewed, like, no, this is wrong. You know, or for parent, father has like, oh, we moved out of the area, so we couldn't be going down to the clinic. And she just, uh, she just been taking medication forever. No, children's gain weight, children changes, so we adjust the dose. So we sometimes increase the dose. Sometimes, you know, depending on, if the, the drug is not working, sometimes we increase the dose. Sometimes, if the, we are still not happy because the goal is that we don't want the child to have seizures to fall. If the child is still having seizures, we may have to add another drug. We try to use one drug as much as possible. Sometimes one drug is not enough. We have to do two drugs. Of course, there are other treatments for seizures, conversion without fever. We have surgery. We have uh, diets, uh, what we call um, ketogenic diets and all that. But we reserve those ones for the very severe cases that don't respond to drugs. Most children will respond to drugs, one drug, some children will respond to two, some children particularly will need three, but this one tends to go to the, the, the super specialist uh special, I mean tertiary or quaternary level of hospital uh cases. But most children will respond to just one drug. But you must take the drugs regularly, you must be seeing your pediatrician at least every three months we adjust the dose you don't stop the medication suddenly, you use it at the right time. Even when the child has, uh, when the, the child is sick or when the children are sick, you still give them the medication. There's nothing like they're fasting, there's nothing that like they're ill and they can't take medication, they must take that medication. Even when they're going for surgery, like you know they staff you before your surgery, they will give you your medication because it's so important that the child take this medication and then they don't have uh, seizure. So for those who have children with seizures, this other place, it's important for you to understand that and it's important for you to take medication. But the good news I have for you is that we usually hope to stop those medications. Uh, like I said, some children three years, some children unfortunately they keep on having the seizures uh, for life. Actually, if there's a specific injury in the brain. So, so you still have adults who have the epilepsy, but the good news is that majority who don't have who have a normal brain. In other words, there's no structural abnormality in the brain, and all that. Some of most of them will stop needing the medication. But remember how I said about how we take off those medications. Please, please, it's so so important that we do a try. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, having talking to us about conversion. And we've talked about fibroid conversions. We've talked about a fibroid conversions. I've talked to us about the causes of conversion and I've talked to us about what to do, how to recognize the child is conversing and what to do when the child is conversing. So if you have any questions on conversion, remember you can send me an email at drgamisela at askthepediatricians.com or askthepediatricians at gmail.com or you can send it to the Fresh Waves Radio WhatsApp number. And of course, you can also head over to our Facebook group and ask the questions there, and we'll be able to answer them. And if you have any topic that you think you want me to talk about, feel free to also send them through all those channels that I have mentioned about above. Remember, you can always watch our past episodes uh, on all the channels that you're watching on right now. The most important thing for your child with having conversion is do them no harm, make sure they are safe, do no harm, and take them to the hospital immediately the conversion stops. And if the conversion does not stop, please remember to call the ambulance within five minutes or get them to the hospital, whichever way you can in your area. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching and for listening to After the Medicine Hour. And I will see you again next time. This program has been brought to you by Active Education Foundation. 
And if you're interested in supporting what we do, you are welcome to reach out to us. You can email at gmail.com or you can add us to our Facebook group and drop us a message there. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Keep our children safe, and I will see you same time next week. Bye. Are you a mother, father or you are involved in caring for children? If yes, then listen to Ask the Pediatricians every Thursday by 10 a.m. for insightful discussion on popular child health topics such as dangerous child health practices, immunization, infant feeding, developmental milestones and so much more. You also get to ask questions on these topics and listen to answers to real-life child health issues by a pediatrician. Ask the Pediatricians Foundation is devoted to health education and information of parents and caregivers of children in the community to support you in raising healthy children. Don't miss Ask the Pediatricians with Dr. Bimi because it's informative, educative and interactive. Ask the Pediatricians Hour, the program for caring parents.